affection and esteem to write uh, a, a speech. But it's another to wake up every single day for that long and know that you're just one signature away from freedom and to have that kind of, um, I mean, the, the, the sheer sort of um, mental toughness to do that was extraordinary. So I think in the West, and, and I have to say among whites in particular, the basis, the sort of emotional basis for, um, for the, the affection and esteem in which Mandela was held was sort of based on relief that here was a man who had been oppressed and imprisoned, etc., etc., but who was quite prepared to come out and forgive. In South Africa, especially among black South Africans, it's something slightly different, I think. Um, I mean, obviously, he, he was a hero to black South Africans, um, most of whom, by the time he came out, didn't know him because he was an old man by the time he came out. But it always struck me that, you know, Mandela was a bit like Washington. He came out and he, George Washington, that is, and he'd served one term, one presidential term, four years, and then retired, walked away. And our, in Africa, of course, our experience has been, has not been that by and large. What tends to happen is that liberation leaders in Africa, they, they, they fight a liberation war, freedom fighters, they become the first president, and then they become president for life, and they get morphs into some kind of authoritarian um, leadership. That's what happens. And it's based on the, the legitimacy, the authenticity of being the leader that has fought and delivered freedom. And that's happened all the way across the continent um, uh, in, in various forms, from, from benign to not benign, but, but essentially have been anti-democratic, ultimately. And Mandela's main legacy, I think, to South Africa going forward was that if ever there was a, there was a leader in, in Africa and indeed the world who was in a position to create a cult and to be a president for life and to stay on and to get the constitution amended, etc., etc., it was Nelson Mandela. And yet he didn't even do a second term, which he could have done quite legitimately. And so South Africa is now on its fourth president. Now, whatever you think of the quality of these presidents, and they've been very mixed, the, the very fact is that we have this precedent of changing leaders so that we don't have the one big man. And that the ANC, of course, is still in power. So that's going to be the big test going down the road, is whether, at what point, the ANC, if it loses an election, will be prepared to go into opposition. Uh, there's, the general consensus is they certainly won't lose the election that's coming up this year. There's an election due uh, somewhere between April and July, and this will be the first election in which the so-called born frees, the kids who were born after the end of apartheid, will vote. Um, and I think that you know there has been there's a lot of dissatisfaction with the A the ruling ANC in terms of service delivery and in terms of their efficiency in terms of people being um, annoyed at the, the rising levels of corruption. But while Mandela was alive, there was this enormous residual loyalty to the ANC, even though Mandela was long retired. And so it'll be interesting to see what effect his death will have on the on the ANC's sort of authority. In, as, as the liberation party. So, but in a way, given who Nelson Mandela was and, you know, and what he would say, for the ANC going forward, is uh, dead Nelson Mandela, who can be, become a portrait on the wall and balance it in the way the Congress in India has done to its uh, heroes, be sort of more useful than Nelson Mandela, who might speak his mind? It's a very interesting point. I mean, the, 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 the sort of iconography of the dead leader, whether that becomes almost more potent because you can, you can start, you can finish the sort of whole process of political sainthood and canonization. I mean, I think the fact that Mandela, while he was still alive, but after he'd retired, sort of started, although he was very loyal to the whole idea of the ANC, which, remember, is, was Africa's oldest liberation movement when he was 100 years old. Um, uh, and he was very, he was very much a sort of party man in that sense, and wouldn't criticise it publicly. But privately, he was making remarks, many of which are now in the archives and being released, um, which show that he was very dissatisfied with with a number of um, things done by the by the ANC leadership. And there is, I mean, you're absolutely right. There's a big sort of struggle at the moment about 
who Nelson Mandela belongs to. Does Nelson Mandela belong to the whole country? Because after all, that was his shtick. He was about unifying the country, including whites, Afrikaners, so-called colors, Indians, and all the different minorities, um, including other, other black tribes other than his own Corsa tribe, the Zulu tribe, which is the biggest single tribe, that he was a sort of man for all seasons, a man for all regions, or whether the ANC said, no, 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 he's, he's ours. And that battle has been played out now in the South African media, it still has a very, um, a, a very uh, sort of lively media with, with um, a critical media. Um, and it's playing out and will play out in the next few months and years. Um, to come from Mandela to Mugabe and your book on the fear about Mugabe, one of the things you said that when Mandela came out of prison, he joked that, you know, until that point, Mugabe had been sort of the colossus on, in African politics. And Mandela joked that Mugabe had grown accustomed to being the star, and then the sun came out. And uh, what was the relationship between the two of them? I mean, not particularly good. And certainly, I mean, I'm, I'm astonished sometimes to see the, 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 the lack of, I mean, you, you'll still see now in places that ought to know better, you'll see in op-ed pieces and sort of, um, uh, and editorials, um, ex explanations as to why South Africa, why the ANC appears to have protected Mugabe for so long and to have been, um, to have en enabled Mugabe to continue. So, I mean, just to briefly bring you up to date, Mugabe, Mugabe was Zimbabwe's first president and he came to power in 1980 and he's still there. He turns 90 years old next month in February um, and he's um, and he the last two elections in fact probably the last three elections by by everything we can so far as there's any transparency at all have been rigged both been rigged and there's been enormous violence so uh, and South Africa Zimbabwe depends overwhelmingly on South Africa in all sorts of ways from, from, from trade routes to, to everything else um, and if the, if there had been the political will in South Africa to restore democracy to Zimbabwe, it would, have, it would have happened, and they haven't done it. And you see these editorials saying, oh, it's because the ANC owes Mugabe a debt uh, for, for his help during the, during the end of the war against apartheid. So if you bear in mind that um, Zimbabwe becomes independent in 1980, and apartheid persists for another 12 or 13 years, essentially, during which time, these editorials will tell you, you know, Mugabe is indeed the chairman of the frontline states, and he is he is um, he's, he's sort of championing the cause against apartheid. And of course, that was his big enabling thing. It was impossible while he was doing that. It was very difficult to criticise Mugabe without appearing to be an apologist for apartheid. If you see what I mean? Because he, because he was, you know, he, he was on the international stage as a sort of an African leader of the anti-apartheid movement. But he didn't do very, in real, in real life, he did very little to, um, to actually help. I mean, for example, he didn't allow any um, incursions by guerrillas, by the Mkontoe Siswe, the armed wing of the ANC, from Zimbabwe into South Africa, whereas both Mozambique and even Botswana allowed that and paid the price. Um, and that, of course, they weren't aligned when they were both liberation movements because they, were, they, they, they both had the way it worked was that the, South, that the ANC was allied to Zapo and Joshua and Como, and they were both um, supported by the, by the Russians, and Zanu Piyev, which was Mugabe's party, and the PAC, which was you know, Black Consciousness, Steve Biko, etc., were both supported by the Chinese. So they were actually rivals during the Liberation War. So that's my, my theory as to why South African uh, governments, why the ANC has protected Mugabe, is that all of the all of the countries, I and mean, if we just keep it to Southern Africa, all of the countries in Southern Africa that fought um, liberation wars uh, for freedom to, to, to ditch colonialism to become um, democratic, um, all of those countries, the liberation um, movement that won the first election and that fought for freedom, is still in power in all of those places. So if you look, if you start. The MPLA in Angola, Zanu PF in Zimbabwe, Prolimo in Mozambique, the ANC in South Africa, and Swapo in Namibia, they're all still in power. They may have changed presidents, but, but, but the party hasn't changed. 
and it's not in the interests of any of these liberation party governments to see any of the other ones be tossed out of power because it, it establishes a precedent that you can do this. Now, there have been other, other regime changes in southern and central Africa, but, but not, not in countries where a real liberation war is being fought. And that's the big difference. And I was struck when I was working for the BBC, I remember doing a documentary in Cuba, and I was struck by the similarity between Cuba and Zimbabwe in terms of the, the um, uh, elevation of the revolution as this, you know, this, um, the, the, the kind of founding mythology of the nation. And that the, the, the party that's sort of liberated the country is without them, you wouldn't have a vote. So how can you possibly vote them out of power? Right. Uh, one of the things you've reported on most extensively is on Zimbabwe under Mugabe, and uh, you know the, the things that we see most often in the paper: the fight over the land, the, of the war veterans, the poets. Um, come, could you just describe for the audience? what that feeling of siege is like. Like you, you, you talk to people about so many different farms and then looking out at these guys pressing in. So the land situation in, in Zimbabwe is again one of those things that appears to be one thing from the outside and then like so many things, the closer you get to it, the more complicated it gets and, and the, the sort of simplistic um, analysis sort of falls away into irritating me things but essentially from the outside it, it, you know a few white farmers um, owned a disproportionate amount of land these commercial farms and um, but they carried on owning them from 1980 all the way through to 2000 so for 20 years under the Mugabe regime under you know what was essentially a socialist government um, in name at least these white commercial farmers were allowed to continue um, and that in fact they were the linchpin of the economy. They employed more people than anybody else. Um, and Zimbabwe doesn't, it doesn't have oil like Nigeria. It's not a resource-based economy, it's a mixed economy. And, and agriculture was sort of the, the, the linchpin of it. And there was, there was always enormous criticism of, of this, that there should be, and, and in fact, even the white farmers themselves began to feel more and more insecure and realize there needed to be land reform. And there was some land reform. So, certain land was given over, but not enough. And there were many, many different plans as to what could be done. But then in 2000, very suddenly, these, um, the land was invaded. And it wasn't invaded in a kind of, um, this wasn't just some a sort of spontaneous uprising. It, people arrived in government trucks and buses and army trucks and things, peasants came onto the farms and drove not just the white farmers off, but the black farm workers off as well. And, um, and the farms, by and large, were, were redistributed, but in a very chaotic way, with no planning at all, and agricultural um, uh, output just absolutely plummeted in, all, in, in every respect, and the economy collapsed. It, so, uh, it collapsed so profoundly that it is, I believe, the fastest decline, the fastest contraction of an economy in the peacetime, of an economy in peace. It, it, you know, you'll see economies um, contracting that quickly during times of war, but not during times of peace. Um, the, the Zimbabwe dollar collapsed, it got so bad that eventually the Zimbabwe dollar was halving in value every 24 hours. It was um, the, 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 the sort of amusing story that people tell about this. There was um, there's rather a good um, golf club and golf course in Harare, I think it's still called the Royal Harare Golf Course. And the pub there inevitably is called the 19th Hole. And um, what people would do is go there before the game instead of after the game and order and pay for their drinks because by the time they'd done the 18 holes, the drinks would have doubled in price. I mean, it was, it was, it was worse than the Weimar Republic. It was sort of extraordinary. And, and, and I mean, it was, you know, Zimbabwe became a failed state almost overnight. It just went over a precipice. And, and it was up until then, bear in mind, I mean, you know, it was a tragedy and there was a sort of classic Greek sense of the word in that you see it coming, you know it's coming, and yet it still comes. It's still, you know, even though everybody sees it happening, somehow it still plays out. So, um, uh, and the, the real story behind it, again, was sort of nothing to do with um, the whites per se. I mean, there was a genuine reason to reform the land. The real reason behind it was that 
that Mugabe realized he was going to lose that election. There'd be opposition building, there'd be a big new opposition party had launched the year before. And the biggest trade union in the country was the Agricultural Workers Union, um, which was the linchpin of the opposition. And the, his, the real target in the, in the drive to, um, to take over the white farms was the black farm workers. And so they were all thrown off the pipes in an in attempt to break, to break them up. So, and, and many of those farm workers had originally, two or three generations before, come from neighboring states, from Malawi, from Zambia, from Mozambique. Um, and once they were kicked off the farms, they had nowhere to go, they had no sort of home area to go to, and they effectively were disenfranchised, they lost their vote. Is one of the differences in decolonization that happened in places in Zimbabwe and happened in places like India, from the previous, they mentioned that in Africa, many of the former, the, the descendants of the former colonial powers got to stay on, whereas in places in Asia, they just left. And is that the source of the friction and everything going forward? I mean, in fact, there were very few settler economies and um, countries in Africa. They were really, they were, they were the two um, Portuguese countries, Angola and Mozambique. Um, and there was um, Zimbabwe, to a lesser extent, Kenya. Um, and essentially South Africa, which had the longest continuous uh, white um, settlement based on the, on the so-called Afrikaners who came in with the Dutch East India Company. So, so I mean, Africa is 53 countries. So as a whole, you know, countries, huge countries like Nigeria, they were, was, was administered in a similar way to India. There was sort of expatriate British kind of colonial office people, but very few. And the Brits, the Brits tended to, in Africa, I mean, the, the Brits tended, to, uh, and I'm only simplifying a little bit here, to come into a country and to look around and ask the question, who's the second most powerful chief? And then someone would say, it's this guy here. Then they would go to him and say, how would you like to be the first most powerful chief? And then, so that they were, you know, rather than just, and, 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 and they would do it through manipulating the power structures. They would sort of find out enough rather than by sheer force of arms. So somewhere like Nigeria, at the height of colonialism, was a huge burgeoning country with millions and millions of people and very small armies sitting there. I mean, they were, which is not to say they weren't acts of violence, etc. of course they were, but, but it, was done, it was done through a sort of, you know, a, a, a manipulation more than, more than just sheer force of arms. So the places which did have bigger white settlements, they've played out, as you say, in a slightly different way. What happened with the Mozambique colonies, um, if you recall, it's a long time ago, I think I'm right in saying that the, the Portugal was ruled by um, dictators and up through to the 70s, and I think in 1974 they, had, they, they were overthrown. And so suddenly those two, the Portuguese colonies, were just um, shed very, very quickly. And in Mozambique and Angola, the, the, the Portuguese settlers 98% of them left overnight and they just poured out. And indeed, both those colonies, the, the economies of both those countries collapsed in, in the immediate. And um, most of them, a lot of them went down to South Africa, some of them went back to, to, to Portugal. And I think, you know, race, race is useful. I mean, it's, it's useful if you're a dictator, if you're an authoritarian ruler in Africa, it can be quite useful to have a small, a small economically privileged um, minority um, that you can kind of you can use at election time and things. I mean, and bear in mind that Mugabe was very um, reconciliatory towards the whites right up until 2000. In his first cabinet, he he had white ministers in it. Minister of Agriculture, yeah. exactly, was a was a was a white person. And the whites did very well for 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 20 years. The whites did perfectly well. I remember getting in trouble with the white farmers. Um, when Mugabe sent his North Korean trained 5th Brigade from the, from the military into the south of the country, Matsubishi land, um, and they committed these terrible massacres, the Matsubishi land massacres. We still don't know how many people were killed. Probably, you know, between 10 and 20,000 civilians were killed. Um, and I started writing pieces about it and agitating about it and whatever. And white farmers, when I would meet them, would come, would upgrade me and say, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you causing trouble? It's nothing to do with us. You should just leave it alone. It's the tribes just, you know, 
sorting out historical grievances amongst themselves. It's nothing to do with us. Fast forward 20 years when I was reporting there, and then the white farmers were coming up to me and saying, please write, write about what's happening to us and how we're being, you know, and I said, uh, excuse me, 20 years ago when we were doing, you know, 15 years before when we were when I was writing about the Massacres, you said, oh, it's just a minority tribe. Don't, you know, why are you causing trouble? So, you know, what goes around comes around. But it, in that sense, you know, is it that obviously something like reconciliation at the end of the, uh, at some kind of a colonial experience is great for the former colonial power because it's kind of like wiping the slate clean will all be friends now will kind of try and get along together. But uh, that's not, you know, you, can you claim, can the white stick claim that as something that should happen or is it like totally dependent on the former colony whether they're going to disavow that as a privilege? I mean, I think that, you know, I, I mean, in South Africa, where apartheid was so hermetic, if the segregation was so complete, I mean, to a ridiculous extent, um, whites just didn't really know blacks. The only blacks they ever met were the servants in their own household. And I remember, you know, when you talked about the idea of majority rule, white South Africans thought they would say, you know, my garden is not capable of being prime minister. You know, they had no